So those were, I call it as A, B, C, D, G parents. So A is abusive parents. So abusive in sexual way or uh, physical way and emotional way. And B is a burdening parents. Burdening in terms of the financial burdening and um, burdening in terms of uh, emotional burdening. And then C is a culturally disjointed. There's a language or the cultural values are not meeting with their, you know, their children. And D is disengaged. It was a very prominent among, particularly among the fathers, you know, the relationship between fathers and the daughters. And G is a gender prescriptive. So gender prescriptive meaning that boys have to act like the boys and girls have to act like the girls. So what we found was that we did the multiple studies actually. This ABCDG parenting was actually predicting their children's poor mental health in the future. But I was thinking, okay, we have these parent characteristics now that we can deal with, then, then is there is because of parents come to this country and they change, or what are the issues? So I wanted to really dis, uh, explore more fundamental issues. So we actually dig more, we analyze more data. So what we found was that these parents were suffering from immigration related problems. These parents had mental health or physical health issues. They were in marriage, but their marriage was terrible. They were fighting all the time and causing a lot of issues in the, in the family dynamics. And they also was having struggling with social cultural linguistic barriers, barriers. And some parents were quite wealthy and some parents were poor, but regardless of their social economic status, they had intense job-related stress. They also didn't have the very strong network <coughs> and they were the victims of the trauma from other countries, the origin, country of origins. Another interesting thing was that they were not really diligent about transmitting the family history. Therefore, these women couldn't really put together the parents' stories, okay? Or the grandparents' stories. They didn't really have the stories, the family histories that they can be proud of. So, what we discovered was that behind these children's mental health issues, it was was parents who were suffering, and parents who were having all these immigration-related issues. So this one woman who received the aware intervention, she discovered that this is a collective struggle that we have in America. So children whose parents suffer from these factors were more vulnerable to developing adverse mental health consequences. And therefore, they are more likely to be challenged if they had more challenges with developing healthy identity formation. So in conclusion, based on this study, we really felt that promoting this immigration, immigrant families, immigrant parents is going to be the key in order for us to really help uh, students and children. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever read this book or you heard about it? Actually, I read it. Okay, part of you Every read page. It. <laughs> very interesting, right? So, this is a very interesting concept, and a lot of social scientists wanted to really actually test uh, or measure the tiger parents. So, my colleague from University of Texas, she decided to measure tiger parents based mm -hmm. on eight dimension of his parenting warmth reasoning, monitor, democrat, democratic, and hostility, control, shaming, punitive. So they did the factor analysis, this is kind of fancy, you know, statistical analysis. So they have found that there actually these were emerging four different types of parents, parenting. But the, uh, the subject for this uh, study was 444 only Chinese parents, okay? So only Chinese parents. Now, what they have found was very interesting. So four themes of the different parenting immersed. One was supportive parents. And the second was tiger parents. 
Third one was easygoing parents. And the last was hostile, hostile parents. So, <coughs> but the good news is this. You know, although <laughs> the other group, she was portraying, portraying that all the Chinese parents are type of parents. In fact, we had more supportive parents. 45 parents were emerged as a pa supportive parents. And type of parents were 27%, easygoing parents were 90%, and harsh parents were 7%. <coughs> now, and these researchers also wanted to test, okay, then what kind of, what type of parents are associated with the best outcome? Looking at the pressure, GPA, depression, and interaction with the parents and child. So what they found was that the best outcome was supportive parents. And not the tiger parents, the second one, the easygoing parents. And the tiger, and the last, you can imagine, the harsh parenting. So this was very interesting to me, because that means that easygoing is much better than tiger. <laughs> you don't have to do anything, that your children are going to be better. <laughs> My children watch TV, I think about this study. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the number one is about like understand where we are coming from, right? And then number two is that we don't have to revisit the assumption that doing well equals feeling well. Mm. That really is not true, particularly among Asian American students. That's why social scientists, we call it as a paradoxical picture. Asian Americans have a paradoxical picture in, in terms of the doing versus feeling and growing. And another thing that I really want to highlight is this, that up until high school, they managed, they, 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 you know, they work very hard, they manage to survive. But when they come to college, because I meet a lot of college students, right, and we primarily target the college students and we analyze them. I've been analyzing this group for the last 10 years. And when they come to college, that's the time that they really are revisiting their identity. And revisiting, like, you know, asking about, okay, I grew up this way, what does that mean? Is it a good value, is it a bad value? And they are really confused about which you know, very conflicting values that they have to navigate. And the interesting thing about Asian American depression is this. Their depression symptoms are a little bit differently manifested compared to white or the other racial population. For instance, Asian uh, people who are depressed, you know, Asian people when they are depressed, they don't really show the depressive symptoms. They don't really show the sadness. Okay? And they don't really have a very high level of guilt. But what they show is a somatic problems. They may be really sick, they may have a stomach they may have back pain, they may have headaches, you know. That's the part of the reason why school counselors cannot catch the Asian American students' depression quite easily. And in college, I hear these sentences from the college administrator or the professors all the time. So they say, I had this beautiful or, you know, these amazing Asian American students who were perfect in their grades, and then one day they disappear and they are hospitalized. So they don't show anything. They don't really express their feelings, their, their pain, and they just keep going. And then one day, there's a collapse. <coughs> That's why they are called, you know, in, in, um, in social science, we call them as a, a hidden ideator. Okay? They may have a suicide ideation, but it's hidden. And they underreport symptoms of suicide, and it's making their symptoms difficult to catch for pro providers and they underutilize mental health services. They yes. also show direct expression of love. I see that there are a lot of parents here. Raise your hand if you don't love your child. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. But do you really think that your children know that you, you love them? We, actually I collaborated with uh, Yoon Sun Choi from University of Chicago. And she did a very interesting study. So she was asking a lot of questions of, to the child, children 
and the parents, the same question, okay? So, did you have a conflict with your parents? Did you fight with your parents last week? And then the children said, yes, I did. But the parents said, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and there were many, many questions they were asked. They both have a very different perceptions, okay? So, what I'm saying is that you love your children so much, right? You can die for them, right? But the problem is that if you show them directly, direct meaning that you have to say it and practice it, I love you, <laughs> like that. You have to do that. Otherwise, they don't really get it. What do my parents, they never said I love you. They, now they say they're little. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they are getting older. They're in Korea. Um, but I never heard I love you when I was growing up. But what they do is that they buy me the best food. <laughs> and what they also do is that they wait for me until I come home. Like it could be 1 a.m. My mom is like, <laughs> but she's staying. Like she's tolerating because she's worried about me. And that's the love that my parents show. And that's the love that you may show to your own children, right? But our children don't care. They don't care. They don't want you to wait for them. They actually don't want you to wait for them. <laughs> <laughs> so our job is that we really, the study really shows that, our study shows that, that you have to express your love and you have to hug them, you have to show the physical expression. We need to start reaching out to our children and talk about the burden of their lives. So we can ask, you know, ask ourselves if you're making comments to burden our children, so I talked about the fact that in the beginning, that when I was in China, when I was in growing up, I had no shoes. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I had to walk like three kilometers to go to school. Yes, that might be true. But you know what? That's, that, that's your time, okay? Your children don't care about that. But you bring the issue all the time. They are sick of it, and then they actually make you like make them feel very burdened. But we don't know that. So we have to identify the source of burden. Now, this is some of the questions that we can ask from time to time. Do you feel like you're losing your control because you have too many responsibilities or other things going on in your life? Do you feel that you are losing the ground in your social life, in relationship with your families and friends and health? And how often do you feel overwhelmed with responsibilities? And how often do you feel stressed out? So these are the specific questions to target the burden. Because in Asian psychology, burden is a very important concept. Now, so, we highlight performance so much. How was your school? How many APs are you taking? Yeah. The grades. A is average, I heard. <laughs> B is bad. <laughs> C is crap. <laughs> D, I forgot. <laughs> so performance does not equal self-worth. This is like how we think about them, performance. But in their lives, this is really their lives. Performance, but they have a relationship with the child, the friend of many friends, and they could be a religious member, and their neighbor, and their siblings, a club member. They have so many things going on in their lives, right? Now, <coughs> we need to start changing our narratives. 